hope you're surviving your journey on Baden Hill. And today we want to talk about our neighbor to the south and how the government of Mexico formed over many decades and really it's still forming today. We need to talk about the the way things changed. Obviously, the system that started with Cortes and his conquest of the Aztecs and the development of Mexico into a land of haciendas, that was something that was very stable. It kept the powerful in power and it kept the campesinos down low. That leads us to the change that was a part of changes happening all over the world. At the end of the 1700s, you were in a period called the Enlightenment, and that led to great thinkers like Thomas Jefferson, Voltaire in France, and many other leaders around the world thinking that in this world, we can make a better place. We can make government that can protect the rights of everybody. And so uh, this was what was being taught in Europe and one of the uh, Criollo, Creole family members in Mexico named Simon Bolivar, he had some privilege because he was Creole. He was of European descent. Even though he was in a peninsular, he could go back to the peninsula, back to Spain and study. And what he did, he, he studied in Spain, he studied in France, and he learned about the Enlightenment. And this led him to realize that people all over the world were in chains, even though they had been born free. And he sought to liberate them. And so his nickname, because of his role in, in these many uh, wars of liberation, his nickname is El Libertador, the liberator, kind of like the Terminator. Uh, and he is seen as a hero throughout Latin America because he actually led to the founding of numerous nations in South America and other nations like Mexico look to Bolivar as a, an, a, a symbol, as an inspiration. Again, he was Criollo and that meant that he wasn't on top. He understood that those uh, peninsulares who came from Spain, they actually had most of the power in Mexico, even though they were essentially foreigners. And the, the Creoles and the peninsulares often were at odds because of this. So this isn't necessarily about a popular revolution at this point, uh, but uh, he definitely did care about the average person, and that's why he's so beloved. He didn't just look out for himself. Remember that Mexico had incredible mineral wealth. Well, that's where Bolivar's family got a lot of their income as well. They had a stake in copper mines, silver mines, gold mines in Venezuela, where he uh, was born and, and was raised. And Venezuela has tremendous resources today. They are one of the greatest oil producing nations in the world. And so, as he uh, was educated and he came to understand his role as a revolutionary of the Enlightenment, uh, that led him to move forward and he became a leader of uh, revolutionary armies in Venezuela and Colombia and uh, throughout uh, Argentina and Bolivia, which is a country that is actually named for him. In addition, many countries have adopted a currency, a money that has his uh, name to it. Boliviano, I think is the name of it. And so he was able to lead armies and conquer uh, the, the various areas of South America. And his vision was to have a united South America, kind of like the United States in North America. Only it just failed. That entrenched power system of the Hacienda system meant that people would fight for independence from Spain. But then once Spain was out of the picture, they would immediately consolidate or grab onto power again. 
And so at the end of his life, you know, even though he had had such incredible success in leading these revolutions and he was the father of Latin America, essentially, uh, he experienced great despair. And he, he said that, you know, we, we have gotten rid of independence at the expense of everything else. So yes, we got rid of Spain, but then everything else has fallen apart. And he talked about the, the, the work that had been done. It's like plowing the ocean. If you can use that as an image, if you plow the ocean, there's nothing left after you're done, right? You don't, you can't grow anything there. So that's Simon Bolivar, the father of revolution in Latin America. Let's talk about Mexican Revolution specifically. It wasn't led by Simón Bolívar, like so many other countries in Latin America. It was actually led by a just an average priest. And the priest happened to be mestizo. So as a mestizo, he, um, he had uh, even less power than Bolívar. And that, that was very significant. Uh, Father Hidalgo was somebody who was able to be educated and he uh, was um, he was a symbol of freedom for people, even though he wasn't a perfect man. He, uh, he enjoyed drinking and gambling and as a result he actually went before the Inquisition the Inquisition, you may know from history, was basically a group of judges in the church, and they had your life in their hands, especially if you were accused of some crime or some spiritual uh, failure. Well, Father Hidalgo uh, survived that, and he continued to be a leader, and he welcomed all people to his house, and he was he was very concerned about the way that things were going and the fact that these huge haciendas had so much power. And so on September 16th, 1810, he, he issued the cry of Dolores. His church was in a town called Dolores. And so this is called the El Grito de Dolores, cry of Dolores. And it was basically a speech saying, we must uh, throw off the yoke of Spain and um, he was able to gather up to a hundred thousand campesinos who rallied to his cry I mean they probably had pitchforks and they were totally unprepared totally untrained but because of their massive numbers they were able to win several battles and they were this wave of popular revolution marching across Mexico to Mexico City and um, it, he, he didn't have a lot of training as a military leader, and that eventually uh, was what led to the failure of that first movement of, of this uh, war for independence. Uh, the Royalist Army, led by you know the Viceroy, remember the Viceroy represents the King, um, that army massed in, and moved toward Mexico City, and as a result, uh, uh, they were driven out and they went to Guadalajara and in Guadalajara there was a bridge and uh, he made his last stand in, in Guadalajara and the army started deserting. Again, these are untrained farmers and they realized that the Royalist army was coming and uh, so they left him and they were completely defeated and after that, uh, Father Hidalgo lost his command of the army. Basically, they blamed him because they had been losing and uh, he was uh, captured by the Royalist army and then executed. And uh, independence from Spain wouldn't come for another decade. And it was on September 27th, 1821, that a military leader uh, named Iturbide Iturbide was the one who was able to march into Mexico City and end the war. And so uh, sometimes the uh, Mexican Independence Day is celebrated on September 16th and sometimes it's celebrated on September 27th because of the difficulty in 
getting people organized and actually having a revolution, first against Spain, and then later it's going to be against the, the wealthy people in Mexico itself. So don't forget, there are actually two wars of revolution in Mexican history. The first is 1810 to 1820, 21 roughly, and the second is 1910 to 1920. And uh, so it's important to understand the first one is called the War for Mexican Independence and the second one is called the Mexican Revolution. Revolutionary ideas continued because society kept falling back into the power structures of classes and monopolies and the rich families, the, the Criollo families who had so much wealth. The Peninsulares basically left after independence from Spain. They, they were able to go back to Spain and they were citizens, right? But the Criollos, the Creoles, were the ones who consolidated their power. And so you have, again, oppression. Well, Benito Juarez was uh, a different kind of leader. And we talked about Priollos and, and Mestizos, and Benito Juarez was an Indio. He was actually indigenous and a native Mexican. He is considered to be the Mexican Lincoln, and it's because of his desire to keep Mexico united, even through many wars and conflicts, uh, his strength, to maintain his presidency even when others were challenging him and there were military uprisings, and also his desire to have a strong central government. Even though nobody really liked that, the, the liberals and the conservatives in the outer states, they wanted to do things their own way. So uh, he rose up from humble Indio beginnings, and he was actually able to marry into a Criollo family, and that's that's kind of how he rose up in Mexican society. Uh, he was born in Oaxaca. Oaxaca uh, is uh, where he eventually became governor, so he consolidated his power and just kept rising up the ranks, and he became uh, the head of the Supreme Court. So that's pretty incredible that he was able to rise to that position. And then when the president resigned because there was pressure, again, liberals who wanted more help for common poor people and conservatives who wanted to maintain traditional land structures and, and rights for business people, they, they were going at it and uh, basically um, you know, the, the president was forced to resign and he, because of the succession as head of the Supreme Court, he became president and he maintained his presidency all the way until his death. Uh, and again, you know, like Lincoln, he, he hung in there even though he was constantly under threat. He had to go into exile uh, during the, the War of Reform, which was a war that was between the liberals and the conservatives and this, uh, this desire on the part of Juarez to help poor people. There was also a, uh, a problem with the Mexican-American War. So Mexico was faced with the, the annexation of Texas and, and the loss of more and more territory and, and resources being fought over between uh, Americans and, and American settlers and Mexico. And so war broke out you know, in, in 1948 and, and um, Juarez supported the, the Mexican war effort, but eventually he realized that it was not going well. And so he decided that he would not, uh, you know, enlist more troops to go and support a continued war against the United States. And, and that shows again, his, his desire was not about uh, fighting for Mexican glory. It was it was about justice, and I think that that's something that we can remember about Juarez and his, his time as leader of Mexico. And this is an inspiration to many Mexican people today. So one thing you have to know, too, is France. During the American Civil War, uh, Mexico faced other enemies. France invaded Mexico, and they, they called it an intervention. Because the Mexican government was kind of a mess, uh, 
France used this as an excuse to put their own ruler on the throne, and his name was Emperor Maximilian I. And Maximilian was, I mean, he was a foreigner. And so, of course, Juarez believed that he was illegitimate and continued to hold on to the presidency, even in exile. And uh, finally, the French were driven out and uh, Juarez regained his presidency. But toward the end of his time in office, he faced intense pressure. Uh, there was some sense that he was maybe, you know, rigging the elections so he would continue to be elected. Uh, and he died in office. But Juarez remains a figure that Mexicans think of as having held the country together when it could have been even controlled by a foreign government. We need to talk about another man who held on to power. His name was Porfirio Diaz. And Porfirio Diaz was, he was a general that during the War of Reform and also during the War of French Intervention. And he, uh, he was one who was able to uh, support, at least what he said, supported the common people. But then when he became the leader with a military coup, he ended up being just as oppressive as a foreign leader or as the, the leaders of the past had been. And he encouraged these massive haciendas and these monopolies. He is seen as somebody who did bring stability after all these wars, but he was a dictator and he was a brutal dictator. And, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people died on the haciendas. Uh, until he was finally uh, removed from office in the revolution of 1910. So, you know, I guess his intention was to be president for life. And there was definitely a sense that the elections were rigged and he continued to be elected. But finally, uh, a kind of a coalition, a, a, an alliance of different people, revolutionary leaders, uh, Zapata and Carranza, were two of the main leaders in the south and in the north. So Zapata in the south and Carranza in the north. And uh, their idea was that uh, reform can happen. And Zapata, he had, again, come from very humble beginnings and he believed in uh, the campesinos and the farmers and that they needed to have more rights. And uh, it was his work, his ideas eventually led to land reform, some land reform. Uh, he uh, promoted the idea called the Plan de Ayala, the Plan de Ayala, and that was this movement to reform Mexican society and to make it more fair so that campesinos could have a living and you wouldn't have these huge haciendas. Uh, eventually, Zapata and Carranza uh, they got into conflict. Zapata would not support Carranza's leadership and that led to a problem later on. Another member of this alliance was Pancho Villa. So let's talk about him. Pancho Villa is maybe one of the most famous figures from Mexican history because he's a bandit. He was a highwayman, somebody who robbed people on the road. And uh, he was enlisted by Zapata, who was also kind of seen as a bandit, and Carranza. So you had this kind of three-way leadership, Carranza and Zapata and, and uh, Pancho Villa. And obviously when you have three people it's not going to work very well they're going to have different ideas and they're all going to struggle for power the revolution to get rid of diaz and have a new free government uh, democracy in mexico uh, happened from 1910 to 1911 uh, diaz was overthrown and uh, zapata and villa again were were uh, used by carranza to accomplish his goals, but then became his enemies, and especially Villa. Villa and Carranza were uh, fighting against each other. 
Now, during this, this time, the United States sees all this chaos and they want to make sure that it doesn't spill over into the United States. And so uh, President Wilson in the United States, he, he's already dealing with the fact that there is a world war happening in Europe. And he basically wants to make sure that uh, things in Mexico uh, don't cause problems for the U.S. And so he, he recognizes Carranza as the legitimate president of Mexico. And this is before the revolution is really done. It goes until 1920 uh, after, you know, Wilson is is gone too. So um, what happened is General Pershing was the leader of the U.S. forces and he became famous in World War One as well. Well, General Pershing uh, took uh, a group of U.S. soldiers into Mexico and it happened because uh, because of the alliance between the United States and Carranza, Pancho Villa was fed up. And he actually pulled some uh, American railroad workers off of a train and executed them. And when that happened, the U.S. military got involved and they started chasing Pancho Villa around the mountains of northern Mexico in the Sierra Madre. And this is a, an incursion by the United States in 1916, 1917. And, uh, Probably the worst uh, situation happened in Columbus, New Mexico, where Pancho Villa actually attacked and burned uh, a, a city. And I mean, it's ironically named Columbus, New Mexico. And it, it just reminds us that, uh, you know, Nogales is just across the border uh, from New, Me New Mexico. The, the U.S. and Mexico are so intertwined and their troubles uh, economically and socially, they spill over into one another and it's important to see this this close relationship close geographically is going to be something that we have to pay attention to i don't think mexico has ever really come out of that revolution of 1910 to 1920 and uh, we need to realize that there's a revolutionary mentality still in mexico that creates some chaos because poor people still don't have the rights that that we feel they should and we need to look at our own country too and ask ourselves are we creating a situation where there's a huge gap between the wealthy and the poor thanks for listening i hope this has helped you understand mexican history